and, and frankly, uh, we need to talk about it. And we have three wonderful speakers tonight to, to help us understand this issue and to understand uh, what's going on. Uh, first would be Vanessa Skipper. She's the VP of Brevard Federation of Teachers here in uh, Brevard County. Uh, Adam Tritt, he is an author, educator, and activist, founder of Foundation 451. And finally, uh, Michael Butler, uh, who is uh, a PhD, who is a, a professor of history at Flagler College. And I should say he's a distinguished professor of history at Flagler College. Uh, and, and it is an honor to have all three of these folks on our panel. Uh, they will be helping you to understand what's going on perhaps what you can do. Uh, we always like to have some action items in our events. And I'm going to ask each of our three speakers to be thinking about what sorts of, of action that our uh, guests, that our members can take to help fight uh, the problems that we have and make our educational system a little bit better. But first of all, I always like to uh, introduce the Space Coast Progressive Alliance president, Rayad al Shaibi. Rayad, you have the floor. Well, thank you. Thank you, Phil. And welcome back. We uh, know you've been on a vacation. We, we missed you last month, but we did great. And, and I just want to also welcome everyone who's joining us uh, on our first Thursday event. Uh, we, we are proud of, of presenting an event every month. And by the way, everyone uh, uh, attending now or on Facebook Live can uh, you know, uh, go and, and to our website and watch all the events, the previous events that we have every month. So on, on this one, I want to uh, thank our Action Project Committee who put these things together every month. And this, this month, uh, I'm sure uh, our old buddy, uh, is young buddy, Larry Abdullah, you always come up with great programs and we appreciate your time and putting this, these things together. And we have a wonderful speakers, leaders of our communities and in positions that can share their, their input, a lot of important information. Today, tonight's event is specifically uh, important, especially at, at this time of, of the year with school starts. Censoring uh, education is a big issue, and we, we hope to educate everyone today and everybody uh, can get to know a little more about this subject because it is, as Phil said, is very important. Uh, before we start, I just want to you know share with everyone our website. It's www.scpaflorida.com. We encourage you to visit the website. If uh, Carol with us today, I don't know if she's with us. Uh, if she's I'm not, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, you are good. Yes. So she'll, Carol in a sec will will share some information about how to join. But uh, at the end of this this event, we hope that everyone can can do something about what he learned today, and we look forward to our presenters to share with us an action item, of course. Uh, so just just a reminder that this next month event is on October sixth. And the subject is electronic voting just before the election in November. Uh, another important subject that we need to, to discuss and educate uh, the public on. So thank you to our speakers and I'll, I'll send it back to uh, Carol. Maybe you can just share some more information about uh, joining uh, this uh, great organization, Space Coast Progressive Alliance. Uh, okay, I'm the treasurer of the Space Coast Progressive Alliance and we have memberships uh, you can join. Uh, with a family membership for $35, with an individual membership for $25, or a student membership for $10. Just go to the website. It has the instructions on how to do that. Uh, you can pay with a credit card on the website. Uh, if you don't want to do that, you can always mail a check to SCPA PO Box 412, Melbourne uh, 32902. And of course, that's for the year, right? That's for, yeah, that's for <laughs> a year. That's for the year. <laughs> Um, and Barbara may want to elaborate on that because she's a part of membership um, and as far as how we're doing that since we're doing all the members in January. But I believe if they pay now, it goes through the end of 2023. Well, I think that's a good idea, Carol. We hadn't really talked about it at the board meeting, but okay. I would like to establish that right now if... Um, since, since, especially since you put it out there, it's a good idea. <laughs> I thought we'd you, already... you, you join. You join today. We'll have you through twenty three. I'll, I'll I'll vote for it. I'll we'll, we'll put it out there. Okay. <laughs> Please join good. us. We'd love to have you and uh, part of our uh, organization. 
I, I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Yep. And back, back to you, Phil. Thank you so much, Ryan. And uh, thanks actually to uh, uh, Carol and to Barbara. Thank you for your work, uh, your ongoing work for years uh, supporting the Space Coast Progressive Alliance and our work. Uh, all of, We have quite a team. And for those of you that are watching, if you've not considered joining, uh, it really, uh, it, it, you might think it's not as great because we're not able to have meetings due to the pandemic at the moment. But frankly, these Zoom events are important. The work that we do, the awareness that we raise, the people that we can bring together as speakers, uh, it is very much worth supporting this organization. I highly uh, encourage it, and I thank those of you that have been members, and we know that we have members, some folks that have been members for a long, long time. We'll be celebrating our 20th anniversary next year. So uh, the Space Coast Progressive Alliance, as I always say, we have the voice of progressive and liberal thought here in Brevard County. So it's great to have all of you uh, joining us tonight. We thank our members for, our, for their support. For those of you that just joined us, uh, again, I'm Phil Stasek, a past president of the Space Coast Progressive Alliance. Our event tonight is called Florida Censorship, Obstructing Education. We have three wonderful speakers tonight uh, on our panel, and uh, each of them will take a little bit of time to talk about their perspective on what's been going on. And, and the whole point of this is that our governor um, has been highly motivated for political reasons, whether uh, for his own reelection or for his aspirations uh, for the presidency, has been uh, intensely pushing our legislature to pass uh, oppressive uh, authoritarian style uh, legislation that, that affects every child and affects our educational system here in the Sunshine State. Um, the uh, don't say gay bill, the anti-woke uh, legislation. They, these are crazy and, and uh, disturbing, and they are interfering with the work of our educators at all levels. Uh, and, and this is harmful in so many ways. So tonight we have, uh, actually, before I get to that, I wanted to ask, do we have anybody in our on our Zoom audience that would like to make a community announcement? Do we have any candidates who would like to make an announcement? I haven't seen anybody. If, if uh, uh, looks, we've, here. we've got one, yes, indeed. Uh, I'll tell you what. Any anybody that would like to make an announcement, please use the uh, functionality here on Zoom to raise your hand. Um, and that that depending on the kind of machine that you've got, either on a, a laptop or a uh, a pad or on your phone in the corner, there's somewhere there's a. a um, a button that would allow you to um, have, they call it reactions, and raising your hand uh, in the reactions brings you to the front of the screen. We can see that you want to talk. Our first speaker tonight is a candidate for Congress, and that is Joanne Terry. So Joanne, it is wonderful to see you, and uh, we've got just three minutes for you, but we encourage you to, uh, to come off of mute, and you have the floor, Joanne Terry. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Phil, and for and to the Space Coast Progressive Alliance for allowing me a couple of minutes tonight. I am Joanne Terry, and I am very honored to be the Democratic candidate for our U.S. House seat here in Dist District 8 going forward to November. You know, as we all know, this is a very critical election, and I want everybody to know that my team and I are working hard to get people out to vote and to attract the swing voters that we really need to finally retire Bill Posey. We have gotten so much good feedback since the primary. We are feeling so good that we can really make this happen this year. And we need, we really need a change, you know, for, for our environment, for our people. Uh, and, and we're really excited. So I would like to invite everybody to go to joanneterry.com to sign up for our newsletter. We have plenty of opportunities for volunteering. We're also planning meets and greets um, throughout the district, both in Indian River County and in Brevard County. And I would also like everyone to let me know if you have or know of any events, groups, or organizations that would, uh, that would like to meet me. I would love to come out and meet your group. I'm, like I said, super excited. My website is joanneterry.com. And I'm, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And I know this is a very, very important subject. And I, I, I'm really looking forward to just getting everybody out to vote this year. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Joanne. It is wonderful to have you here tonight because this is an important topic. Do we have anybody else here on the Zoom audience that would like to uh, make a uh, public announcement? Uh, and those that are on Facebook Live um, might be able to send us a message if they would like. Uh, one thing I always encourage folks to uh, to do while they're on our events is to go look at the chat. Sometimes we'll have uh, guests that come in and they'll have good information to share in our chat section. And uh, we uh, strongly encourage that. And by the way, near the end of our event, after our panel is done with their presentation, we open the floor to you. Uh, those that are here uh, in our Zoom audience can again raise their hand and ask questions of our audience. It is a wonderful opportunity to get a great dialogue going. I love to see it when the panelists are talking to each other and they're talking to our, our audience. Uh, we, we highly uh, encourage that. We all learn more uh, when we get a chance to get a good two-way discussion going. Um, in fact, Adam Tritt just put a, uh, just posted in the chat uh, a link to his foundation451.org. Um, and again, for those of you that have just joined us, I'm Phil Stasek. You're on the Space Coast Progressive Alliance first Thursday event called Florida Censorship, Obstructing Education. Um, our three speakers tonight, uh, Vanessa Skipper, VP, Brevard Education of Brevard Federation of Teachers, uh, Adam Tritt, author, educator, and activist, founder of Foundation 451, uh, Dr. Uh, J. Michael Butler. He's the author and distinguished professor of history at Flagler College. Um, and the thrust of tonight's event is what's going on. Our, our legislature is messing with our, our schools. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to hand it right over to Vanessa. Vanessa Skipper, again, Vice President, Brevard Federation of Teachers, you have the floor. Thank you, Phil. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm excited to be here, honored to have been invited uh, to speak on this very timely and important topic. Um, as Phil said, I am the Vice President of the Brevard Federation of Teachers. I've served in this role for four years, but I have been in the Brevard Public School District for 17 years. I started my career in Titusville at Jackson Middle teaching English language arts and then taught English and journalism at Cocoa High for nine years. Um, literacy is my passion. Uh, finding a, a book where each child can get lost in and read um, has been a goal of mine for years. And I always tell uh, my students that tell me that they don't like to read, that you just haven't found the book that you like yet. You haven't found the author that is going to speak to your soul or the subject or the writing style. And so to see the laws that are being passed, to see what is uh, being pushed down on our, our teachers in the classroom is absolutely devastating to me. It's devastating to me as a teacher, it's de devastating to me as a, a citizen, and it's devastating to me uh, as someone who is not only a product of, of Brevard Public Schools, uh, but also who has um, a son currently in high school in a Brevard public school. Um, I don't want my son to be limited in what he has access to in school. And frankly, that's happening as we speak. We saw classrooms around the district, around the state, um, open without their classroom libraries because guidance came down from the DOE based on House Bill 1467 that basically said instructional materials, classroom materials, materials in libraries had to be reviewed. And so students around this district on August 10th walked into classrooms without books on shelves. Um, and that's unacceptable. And so one of the answers, you know, we got, well, the, the teacher can just put all their titles into Follette and see if it's an approved title. And if it's an approved title, it can go on their shelf. Well, we're not even beginning to talk about the time and effort um, that goes into to such a thing. And um, so then the suggestion was, well, you know, they should just get some parent volunteers or, or some people to come volunteer to do it for them. Well, that's not available to every teacher in every classroom. And really what it's doing is, is just stifling access, um, especially to our students in our lower socioeconomic areas 
um, who may not have uh, the ability to go to the library during the summer or the ability to go to the bookstore to purchase a title that, that they want to read. And that's another heartbreaking thing for me because I, you know, obviously I taught my fair share of reluctant readers, but I also taught a very wide berth of students who love to read and whose access to books was in my classroom. And they knew as soon as they came in to my room, there would be new titles on the shelves because I would have spent my summer reading book lists and reading different books that I thought that they might engage with. And I thought that, um, you know, might reach a wide array of interests and they would be on my classroom library ready for checkout. And to think that I would start the year like many of my colleagues did with an empty bookshelf is, is, is absolutely ridiculous. Um, what Governor DeSantis has done is nothing short of um, dictator-like. And it's frustrating to me because I will call this, uh, and, and honestly, it's been an experience for the past four years back to you know when Governor DeSantis was uh, trying to get elected in the first place, he loves to use dog whistles. And this is nothing but another dog whistle. This is nothing but a whistle to his base to fire them up um, before this gubernatorial election, uh, perhaps aspirations to the White House. And so he's passing laws that honestly don't need to, not only do they not need to exist, but a lot of them contradict uh, what is actually listed in our standards that we have to teach in the classroom. And it's crying, you know, I got rid of uh, critical race theory in schools. We're not, we're not teaching CRT in schools. That is a college-based theory. But what is happening now, because, you know, his base has latched onto this, are now actively seeking what they think is the teaching of CRT in our schools. And obviously that's not happening, but we've had instances of uh, a teacher saying, well, there's black children in the book, so we're teaching CRT, that, that has happened. Um, we've had instances of, you know, talking about Jim Pro laws. Uh, we've had teachers, lesson plans and PowerPoints, public records requested already and no short of bullied because they believed teachers are teaching things that they are not supposed to be teaching when the law says that we are supposed to teach about racism and about the history and the construct of Jim Crow laws and slavery. Uh, all of that is in our standards. All of that is actually in the law. But when you get up from your bully pulpit and you talk about how we shouldn't teach children to feel bad because of the color of their skin, that's not happening. Um, but all we hear is the governor talking about, you know, teachers shouldn't indoctrinate children. Yeah, we already know that. We don't do that. It's, it's, it's not happening in our schools. But what's happening is the governor is getting up and saying that's happening. Instead of focusing on passing laws that, I don't know, cap rent, or house prices in this in the state, um, we'd rather force people into homelessness uh, in the name of getting reelected to an office or getting elected to a higher office. Um, I also liken it to uh, a witch hunt. Uh, there is now a process for parents to report to the DOE if they think their child's teacher is teaching something that they shouldn't, um, if they are indoctrinating children, um, if they are doing anything that the parent finds maybe offensive to them. Um, and so I, I argue, what, what's the purpose of this? When we have a shortage of 9,000 teachers in the state of Florida, so we can say, obviously, teacher pay is a huge issue, uh, but right along with that is the respect that is just draining from the profession. Uh, teachers are being accused of being teaching things that they're not 
indoctrinating children, not being allowed to have autonomy in what they're doing in their classrooms, not being able to um, create spaces that are welcome for all children, um, not just a certain sector of children. And, and now um, there is a, a route for parents to sue districts and report um, teachers directly to the DOE. It's disappointing. Um, it is horrifying. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I said it, I keep saying it. Uh, book banners are, are never the good guys in history. They're never, ever the good guys in history. You look at everybody that has tried to ban books or burn books, uh, Emperor Hong and China, Adolf Hitler, uh, never the good guys. And so here we are starting to ban books again. Here we are challenging books. And it's a problem that didn't exist. In Brevard County, and I am sure, around the state and other counties as well, there's already a mechanism in place for parents to say that they don't want their children to have access to certain titles. They just have to say, I don't want my child reading about these topics. And a flag is put on their account so they cannot check out those books. If a parent ever reached out to me and said they were uncomfortable with something that their child was reading, I never forced a child to read something the parent did not want them to read. It's a absolute farce that this is an actual problem that, to, that is existing in our schools right now because it's not. Um, I am very frustrated with the DOE with the legislature and with districts responses to the entire thing because they passed this law and now nobody really knows just how they're supposed to respond to things because the law is so vague. And the law is vague because it's a law and I've said it over and over again, I feel like I keep needing to, it's a law that didn't need to be passed in the first place. We're going so far in this district um, to put it, they're calling, put a pause, a pause on our scholastic book fairs, uh, which I think is absolutely ridiculous because a scholastic book fair is one of the only ways for a media center to raise money in a school. And there's very little funding that goes into the ability to purchase books or, or purchase special things. Um, a lot of our libraries like to purchase STEM activities, um, and make it a really uh, fun place for students to come and explore different things, not just necessarily reading books. And one of the big ways they raise money for that is through a Scholastic Book Fair. Well, um, they're worried that Scholastic might bring a book that's not approved or a parent might complain about. To that, I say, Scholastic is a, is a choice. I know with my uh, children, and if anybody on here has ever had a a child go through the schools, they would get excited about going to the Scholastic Book Fair. You send them money in, usually you have to give them a mild thread of you have to come home with a book plus all the little fun pencils and erasers and everything that you want to buy. But if a parent doesn't want their child to attend the Scholastic Book Fair, then they just don't send their child with money into school. Or they let the teacher know, I don't want my child to visit the Scholastic Book Fair. And that's all that you need to do. But instead of just moving forward with it, we're going to take this opportunity away from, from all children. And so I really feel that a very narrow lane of voices is being allowed to control the voice for all. And I don't think that the general public understands how big of an issue this is. And I fear that it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And unfortunately, while I do feel that we have some federal protections um, for, for teachers and students um, against discrimination, I, I don't ever wanna see books limited for students. And I don't ever want to see a teacher losing their job because somebody accused them of saying something or doing something. And we have to take that fight so far federally um, to get it rectified. Um, 
I'm reminded of um, one of my uh, favorite authors who I believe is on one of the uh, challenge lists by our, our local group who shall remain unnamed because I don't like to give people power, but one of our local groups that is ranting and raving and um, calling for books to re be removed um, from classrooms. I believe Ellen Hopkins is one of those um, authors and she was one of my favorite authors to have on my shelf in my classroom library. Although she, you know, there was definitely mature content in it. And so it was only checked out to older grade levels. And that was something that I had a discussion with not only the student and the parent um, before they read those books and um, in the library too, because I used to help out in the media centers. Um, and if a student brought up one of the books, it would say this is for grade 12 only. Um, but there is um, a poem by Ellen Hopkins that I'd like to share if that's okay. Uh, and she said, to you zealots and bigots and false patriots who live in fear of discourse, you screamers and banners and burners who would force books off shelves in your brand name of greater good. You say you're afraid for children, innocence ripe for corruption by perversion or sorcery on the page, but sticks and stones do break bones and ignorance is no armor. You do not speak for me and will not deny my kids magic in favor of miracles. You say you're afraid for America, the red, white, and blue, corroded by terrorists, socialists, the sexually confused. But we are a vast quilt of patchwork cultures and multi-gendered identities. You cannot speak for those whose ancestors braved different seas. You say you're afraid for God, the living word eroded by Muhammad and Darwin and Magdalene. But the omnipotent omnipotent sculptor of heaven and earth designed intelligence. Surely you dare not speak for the father who opens his arms to all. A word to the unwise, torch every book, char every page, burn every word to ash. Ideas are incombustible and therein lies your real fear. And I think at the heart of this whole thing is the idea that our youth are becoming more empowered. And every single day that I watch the younger generation and I watch them get engaged in um, the political realm and in social justice, I am encouraged um, because, and I think that we need to do everything in our power to lift up the younger generation, to, um, to help them, to be there for them, to get the word out, to make sure that we elect people that are going to undo um, tragic bills such as the, uh, these. But I believe that that is what Governor DeSantis is afraid of. He is afraid of um, young people who can think for themselves, which at the end of the day, I don't know one teacher in my entire experience that I could ever say, indoctrinated children. And I worked alongside Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, nonpartisan, not one of them that I taught next to showed up every day and said, I'm going to indoctrinate some children today. One minute. I think, I yes. Oh, thank you. But what I do know that my colleagues did was work to facilitate the gathering of information the discussion of ideas. Um, and a lot of that was based on having accessibility to a wide and rich array of literature and nonfiction to which they could read and discuss and debate. Um, and so what I would like to see is a, a, a push to really encourage the general public to understand what is happening. We don't tell students how to think, but what we do do is encourage free thought. And if we continue on the path that we are on, um, we are going to stifle free thought. And honestly, we're going to chase more teachers off. We've, we're sitting at a 9,000 teacher shortage in Florida, and I think we're close to 200 still in Brevard. And if we don't do something quickly, both in compens compensation for teachers, but also in respect for the profession, um, it is going to get worse. So I would challenge everybody 
um, to get out the vote and to really, really discuss um, these issues with your neighbors, with your family. Um, and always remember, book banners are never the good guys in history. Well, thank you so much, Vanessa. That was beautiful. In fact, that that poem was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, clearly, thank you. clearly a book that should be banned, if not burned. Uh, <laughs> the, the the this is this is really very disturbing uh, because for those that are students of history, you understand that these kinds of authoritarian actions they start off soft, and they often are not noticed by the general public until the drip 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 of these kinds of uh, thought control um, activities take away our rights a little bit at a time and pretty soon you don't have your rights anymore. Um, we've certainly seen that in a number of places, as you've mentioned, but yeah, book banning does lead to book burning and, and much worse. And, and it is something that we all need to be very, very, very concerned about. Uh, we're so proud of you, Vanessa. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you for your work. For those of you that are just joining us, uh, you are on the Space Coast Progressive Alliance first Thursday event called Florida Censorship, Obstructing Education. We have a wonderful team of three, uh, a panel of three uh, speakers tonight. You just heard Vanessa Skipper, Vice President of the Brevard Federation of Teachers. Next up will be Adam Tritt. Adam is an author, an educator, an activist, and the founder of Foundation 451. I encourage you to uh, look into the chat section if you're here on Zoom. Adam has been loading links to Foundation 451 and some other uh, links that are, I think, probably very interesting. It's very much worthwhile. I would like to remind everybody that the Space Coast Progressive Alliance encourages people to vote. Um, obviously, we've just gone through our primary and uh, the election for some of our school board members. Um, but it is essential that every one of us participate in the political process because that is the way we really can change uh, the course of our society. Uh, it's the best thing that you, the best nonviolent thing you could do, I guess, is, is to uh, vote and bring into a public service folks that actually have your best interests at heart. So uh, the Space Coast Progressive Alliance is a Florida not-for-profit. We always uh, tell folks we are a nonpartisan organization. We always like to open the Florida to all, all ideas. A variety of ideas makes the discussion much richer. Um, and we are so lucky to have these wonderful speakers tonight. Again, our next speaker, Adam Tritt. Adam, you have the floor. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, let's talk about Ellen Hopkins before I talk about anything else. Vanessa brought up Ellen Hopkins. At one of our book giveaways, a student picks up Crank, a book written in thick book. I mean, f f four inches thick at least, um, written by Ellen Hopkins about drug use and coming out of drug use, surviving drug abuse. The student picks it up, looks at it. She obviously needs some assistance, puts the book down. A person walks over picks up this book, a extremely young lady, probably right out of high school, picks it up, shows it to her and says, you need this book. This book saved my life. This is a book that young lady would not have seen in school. A kid walks over and sees this book is gay, which is in Follett, but you're not going to see it in school. Puts, picks it up puts it down, picks it up, puts it down, comes back four times before she whispers, can I have this? I need this. She would not have seen that book in school. And just today in class, a student on their own asks if she can recite a poem. Why not? It's about beauty and it is from Milk and Honey by Rupi Kaur. She recites this and tells us how important this poem is to us. It's in Follett. It could be in the library, but we are not allowed to use it in our class. And it is on the list that I posted, as is Crank on the list that I posted, as is This Book is Gay on the list that I posted. These are the books that uh, I will I will I will abide by the precedence 
the group that shall be, remain nameless, they want these out of our school. These are the books being challenged. The most important books we could have are being challenged. But when the library uh, librarian came into my room, she pulled down a book by Longfellow, and she pulled down a book by uh, poems by Sylvia Plath, and she pulled down a book of poems by Mary Oliver, and she said, I'm sorry, these are not in Follett. Do you understand the implication of this? There is nothing in these books anyone could have a difficulty with. Mary Oliver, but it's not in Follett. We cannot have it. Last year, before the end of school, I get an email. It tells me I need to pull Slaughterhouse-Five off of my shelves. I'm not allowed to give it to the students. The students are not allowed access to it. This is a book written by a combat infantry veteran and POW. His first-hand experience of the firebombing of Dresden, of surviving it, and then his break with reality following it. We cannot have it. So much for respect for our veterans. I had to pull that, pull them off of my shelf after years of using them. The kite runner had to be pulled from the shelves. Not a week later, I get an email from the Department of Education telling me I need to let them know exactly what materials, what textbooks I am using in my AP class. They need to look at them and make sure they do not run afoul of the Parental Rights Act, otherwise known as Stop Woke. I haven't had a textbook in the seven years I've been teaching it. I've begged for textbooks. And I told them that and told them they were welcome to come to my classroom and comb my filing cabinets for anything I could manage to cobble together. I get no response from this. I got mad. I got mad and I decided I was going to give books away because I'm, because I'm like that. So I said, I'll, I'll show you. I'll give these books away this summer. I'll give away uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, and I'm going to give away The Kite Runner. I need some money for this. I'm a teacher, so I have none. So I'll go ask for some money. I wanted 500 bucks. People donated and donated and donated and donated and donated and continued to donate. And within a week, we were at an event with an entire table of banned books. Within two weeks, we had two tables of banned books, banned and challenged books. My goal, my first goal was to have every book, every book Mom for Liberty, my apologies, every book they wanted banned, I had on that table. And then we went to the ACLU top 10. And then we went to the ALA top 10. And then we went to the Washington Post top 10. We have nearly all of those, including board books up through books for high school, all of which are banned or challenged in this country. I mentioned three, but I also want to mention A Light in the Attic, Shel Silverstein. I'm not sure you can get more classic than that unless you want to go to the Lorax. Also, banned in many places because kids look at the picture of clear cutting and they look out the window and wonder, oh, so this is what it's talking about? Well, and we can't have that in certain parts of our country. The list here, Judy Bloom is on the list. Forever by Judy Bloom, which teaches young people first love is losing first love is not the end of the world. What, who doesn't need to learn that lesson? I needed to learn that lesson all the way through my 40s. It's an important lesson. They want that out. Siddhartha, 
gone in many places. Siddhartha, Grapes of Wrath, Classics, Lord of the Flies, Classics, gone. New books, Ellen Hopkins is a, is a, is a favorite of these people to ban. Uh, Push by Sapphire, gone. The books kids want to read. The books that show the world the way it is and tell them what they need to know to discover who they are and how they fit in, those books are gone. First week of school, we are told we need to be cognizant of the kids in our classroom because, and this is stats that came to us directly from our principal, the suicide rate in LGBTQ students has skyrocketed to over 100% of what it was a few years ago. What do we expect when we are doing our best to erase them from the literature, erase them from the library, and erase them from the classroom? They have no representation. In this, if this list goes through, they will have zero representation. It's not just a list. The governor, through this act, me, is, is showing us that there's things we can't teach, but we don't know exactly what it is, what they are. So I am tasked with teaching this, the Tempest, somehow without mentioning colonialism or sexism. When we know from Shakespeare's writings the last, the last play he wrote, he was sticking it to the monarchy by talking about colonialism. But I can't mention it. What does the blood in, uh, in Sander Cisneros' house on Mangle Street? Please, will someone figure it out so I can, don't have to be the one that says it? Because I, can I mention it? It might make someone feel uncomfortable. Can I pull something out of the 1619 Project? No, better not. I received a box of books last week. The Stars Under Our Feet. What a lovely, lovely novel this is. I don't know if any of you have read it. It's about a young black child growing up, doing the best he can. It's a middle school book. His father is engaged in his life. He's not present all the time, but he's engaged. A loving father, a loving mother, friends. They weren't sure they could use it. Sixth grade, so they sent it up to the middle school. The middle school teachers were afraid to use it. So I am now giving away a, a, a box of perfectly new 36 copies, a class set of the stars under our feet. Because of the stop woke law, teachers are not just walking on eggshells, they're afraid to open their mouths. They're afraid to say the wrong thing and get fired. So the ramifications of this go past. Simply, the law says this, just follow the law, which is what we're told frequently, just follow the law. And it's not just physical books. Don't let them lie to you. It's not physical books. They're not just after what's in the library, in the classroom. They'll tell you that, but they are lying. Because as we know today, Yesterday, the judge put a stop to a suit to tell Barnes & Noble what they could and could not sell. But the laws are coming. They're coming again and again. You know that's not that's only the first foray. Pride tables are being removed. Displays are being removed from libraries. And before school started, the online library available to our students in BPS I don't was think removed. Do it in the freezer. Was removed. So it's not just what's in the school, it's what they can access at home even. That was removed. So if they tell you it's just about what's in school, they are lying to you. That is only the first step. Our goal is to make sure no matter what happens in school, these kids have the books. They know they're represented. We have the Holocaust books. We have books on racial justice, economic justice. We have everything from the 1619 Project down to anti-racist baby. 
Stamped, Pushed, Feminist Baby, The Lorax, the classics that are being removed, books by Hispanic authors, LGBTQ authors, Jewish authors, all the representation they want to remove from the schools, we are going to be going out, have been going out, will continue going out and making sure it's available to everybody because we cannot let them do this. And if voting isn't enough, and sometimes it isn't, there has to be direct action as well. That is our purpose. I think I'm under 20 minutes, but <laughs> so if you have any questions, go for it. Well, thank you, Adam. I'll tell you what, that's you've been very, very powerful. Um, honestly, I, uh, I feel a little pain in the pit of my stomach listening to you talk. Some of some very popular uh, authors, some very important ideas that um, that our governor and that our fools in the legislature think that somehow they can hide. Um, I, I, an interesting thing that, and I'm going to have to ask my the the panel to bring this up when we get into the Q and A. But it seems in all of my life. The books that I've wanted to read the most, the things that I've always wanted to see are the ones that somebody told me I can't see. Oh, no, you shouldn't look at that. Oh, no, uh, you're going to get in trouble if you take that off the shelf. And oh, baby, I'll tell you what, as kids, uh, young people, and I hope that as most of us as adults, the things that you want to really find out about are the things that people are telling you that you should not know about. The, the only Pulitzer Prize winning graphic novel in history is on the list. Oh. Well, again, First everybody of the of the Holocaust. Again, everybody, um, my thanks to Adam Tritt. And I, I again, one of the things that that I know that we we often say at our uh, Zoom events is that if we were live, you'd have a standing ovation right now. Vanessa, Adam, uh, both of you would have certainly uh, enjoyed the feeling of of love and warmth and welcome. And uh, these are important ideas that have to be discussed. Uh, we will be doing, uh, we will be opening the floor to questions and answers from our uh, audience uh, after our panel is complete. But now it's time for our third uh, speaker, um, Michael Butler, J. Michael Butler, uh, PhD, author, distinguished professor of history from Flagler College. Mike, you have the floor. Thank you so much for having me, Mr. Stasek. Um, I, I really appreciate the invite. And with every forum that I address, I usually have a different format. I wasn't sure exactly what to expect tonight. I mean, you know, you've got the PowerPoint, you've got the notes, you have all that. But if you're not really, really, really angry at this point, you're not paying attention. I started out wanting to inform. Now I want to burn stuff down. And the reason that I want to burn it down is because we have groups that this vague legislation, intentionally vague, might I add, whose purpose is the destruction of our public education system, has empowered anti-intellectual domestic terrorist groups like Mom for, Moms for Liberty, let's call it what it is. They are an anti-intellectual domestic terrorist organization because of the tactics that they use and the people that they target. I'll tell a story. I'm a historian. I'm a storyteller, right? A story of what I do for a living. And that is specialize in the American Civil Rights Movement. Now, there are a variety of reasons I arrived at that area of specialty. Right, and that's another lecture probably for another day. But one of the biggest honors that I can receive is being able to share what I know, being able to share my passion about a topic that is the quintessential American story, by the way. How, because of race, a group of people in this country were denied constitutional equality over a human construction and how those rights were finally 
one and how it's still a work in progress. My biggest honor is to be able to share these ideas and these passions and this knowledge with community members, with civic organizations, with teachers. I've had the opportunity, the great privilege, to be asked by the Florida Humanities Council, to be asked by the National Council of History Educators, to participate in teacher training workshops, and one of which I was asked last November to give a presentation, a day-long seminar actually, on the long civil rights movement. Now, the long civil rights movement is basically the idea that there is no starting point nor end date of the struggle for racial equality in this country. Cool. It was in Osceola County. I planned with a master teacher, someone who was actually in the public school system, because at the college level, I don't know how to talk to third graders about race relations, right? They do. I had a master teacher. I was the lead scholar. That sounds real fancy, right? and had planned this. It was a chronological and topical examination of the greatest hits of the civil rights movement starting in 1896 and going down through my research in Florida today. Cool. Three days before we were to give this presentation, this seminar, right? It was part of a two-year-long cohort. It was the civil rights section of the curriculum, the month before Black History Month. The Osceola Board of Education contacted the National Council of History Educators and said, just because of the topic, just because of the title of the seminar, the long civil rights movement, that it, quote, raises red flags with the discussions we're having at the state and local level on critical race theory. So it was postponed. It was actually canceled. It was canceled because a committee was formed that I still have had no contact with. And by the way, no one from Osceola County from the school district has ever reached out to me, asked to see the PowerPoints I intended to use, wanted to see my credentials, anything. Nothing. It was the title alone, Civil Rights Movement, that triggered the red flags of critical race theory. Now, as Vanessa already pointed out, I'll go a step further and say critical race theory is not a theory that's taught at the college level, period. It's taught in law schools. It is a legal theory. It is a legal theory of how 350 years of discrimination has continued to infiltrate our legal institutions and still have consequences today. It is a prism through which to understand the contemporary judicial system, period, hard stop. It's not taught in college. It's taught in only the upper divisions of law schools. It is a problem as identified by certain political groups that does not exist. It's definitional theft, guys. And that's what we're waging a war against, definitional theft. So because of this, this idea that the civil rights movement is somehow equal to CRT, I was canceled from the party that despises cancel culture. I didn't know that CRT meant civil rights training, but here we are. So teachers who were going to Alabama, my home state, I know the accent through y'all, right? I know, I know you probably couldn't figure that one out, but I'm from Alabama. They were going to Alabama on a field trip to Montgomery, to Birmingham, and they did not have the content that was promised to them by the National Council of History Educators because of laws that were passed in this state, which were deliberately vague. I will give school district a little bit of grace. When we have a governor who basically says, you will not mandate masks 
to protect students in the midst of a pandemic, or we will withhold funding, state funding, and the state board of education does, school boards are very, very nervous. The nature of the legislation itself is very vague. It identifies problems that, does, that do not exist, like indoctrination. Oh, and by the way, the way the game plan here, and for those of you who are teaching, you probably know this, but even as I did research in preparing similar presentations that I've given, it's much more insidious than, than even just labeling. Right. So we've got the Board of Education that revises standards, that reforms curriculum. OK, when it comes to history, the anti-indoctrination camp has now imposed training what they call patriotic values. In which new history curriculum has to discuss. Hold on. This is a great quote. I couldn't make this up if I had to. The K through 12 civics curriculum has to contrast the United States with communist and totalitarian governments using portraits of patriotism that reveal the evils of communism and totalitarian ideologies. How ironic that the mandating of that curriculum is in fact a totalitarian ideology. Okay, it's one sided. Then the governor calls attention to a perceived problem to provoke public outrage. And the next step, so we've got the, Depart the Board of Education that's reforming curriculum. We have a governor who then, Vanessa called it a dog whistle. We can't hear a dog whistle, but we can hear a bullhorn. We have a bullhorn that goes out saying CRT teaches our students to hate America, to hate each other. It teaches that one race is inferior and the perpetual oppressor. Bull. That is not what it is. Definitional theft. But yet people believe it and support legislation to correct a problem that doesn't exist. So now we have legislation in place. This is a, a dangerous, dangerous game. The Board of Education is modifying curriculum. Attention is focused on issues by people who are not acting in good faith. We are not dealing with good faith actors. They don't care about the quality of education. They simply want to use it for political purposes, damn the consequences. Now, if you're really nefarious, you could argue that the end game is to abolish the public education system as it is. And when you have that domestic terror anti-intellectual group host a speaker like Bexie the Voice, who says that the Department of Education should be abolished and she gets a standing ovation, I don't think that's a lot of speculative thought. I think it's pretty accurate, right? There's a war on public education. They are calling y'all. Y'all are who are in public schools. They're calling you groomers. Okay? That's unbelievable. I mean, it really is. So my story, when it happened to me, the teachers were pretty outraged. Yet they were afraid, to go back to Adam's point, they're afraid to speak out. They're afraid to go on record and ask hard questions. At the college level, I do have a degree of intellectual freedom. So what I did was basically told my story. It, as the kids say, went viral. That was weird. And it became a national story. I knew that things had gotten really big when Gabrielle Union we retweeted my story. Whoa. What, what, what's up with that? When NBC calls, when Anderson Cooper calls, yeah. And one of the reporters for NBC told me, when I expressed to him, I cannot believe that this has received the attention that it did. His words, I'll never forget them, and they have been prophetic. Yours is the first of many stories that are going to come out of this censorship movement. So he was right. 
he was right. I feel for the teachers in our public schools because there is a very real campaign to silence, intimidate, harass. I don't know what the answer is other than for me at a personal level to tell my story. The war is being waged at the school board level because now school boards have been politicized. Do you know we've never had a governor who has endorsed a school board candidate until this year? And 25 school board candidates were endorsed. And in this world of that the former guy has created, every accusation is a confession. So when you claim that there is indoctrination going on, what you really want to do is counter that with your own brand of indoctrination. I'm reading the stories that are coming out of our public schools right now, and it's heartbreaking. In Sarasota County, the Rotary Club donates hundreds of dictionaries a year to the schools. They can't because a media specialist can't vet them. A position, by the way, in most Sarasota County schools that have been cut for budgetary reasons. There is no media specialist in many schools. As Vanessa pointed out, there are no book fairs. That used to be my favorite time of the year, right? If we had to give this a silver lining of sorts, I will say that there are a few things for us to consider. I hope it's not too little too late but it reinforces the importance of the vote. That's one thing. We have local examples of why participating in all elections, not just presidential. Presidential elections are important, but they don't have the sort of day-to-day -day ramification that our local school district, our local solicitors, our local elections have. Now we have something to point to to say, see, do you want them determining what your teachers can and can't say? Second thing is, all of a sudden, there's a lot of interest in the college level in civil rights, African-American history. If history makes you comfortable, your teacher got it wrong. History's not comfortable. History doesn't care about your feelings. History's complex. History is messy, history is contradictory, and it's not always reinforcing what we want to see as the best of our country. Oftentimes it holds up a mirror to expose the hypocrisy and how brave people who are just like our students stood up to that injustice or sometimes just sat down. Everyday average people have used this system to change the system, and that is quintessentially American. And that's what the censorship groups fear most. People who can think critically, people who are intellectually curious, people who have a thirst for an understanding of our past that does not simply reinforce everything that they want to think about a complex, messy topic. So at the college level, there is interest now in these CRT related courses, right? When I was a kid, one of the things that began to happen is that when we went to the record stores, when we went to the CD stores, we began to see warning labels on CDs. And you know what that made us want to do? Listen. It's the forbidden fruit and students are attracted to it. They wanna know what the fuss is about. And then they say, this is it, this happened. And then they get mad <laughs> and then they wanna vote and then they wanna make a change. The action items are voting. The action items are being honest with students when you can be. The action items are educating yourself. 
being up on the literature pertaining to what the government is up to, what the educators are, the Board of Education is doing, what our representatives, how they're voting, it's hard, hard work, man. We have careers, we have families, we have lives of our own. But for me, the best tactic we can use is when someone tries to hijack a term like critical race theory, ask them a simple question. What is it? And have an answer. And have an answer. It doesn't take a lot of work, but this idea of intellectual curiosity and critical thinking and analytical skills, that's what the educators possess that scares the hell out of political opportunists. So those are the action items. That's all. Vote, read a lot, tell the truth. Thank you. Well, Doc, I tell you what, it's magnificent, magnificent. Thank you for, thank you for opening our eyes and opening our minds. Um, for those of you that have just joined us, um, you are on the Space Coast Progressive Alliance, Florida Censorship, Obstructing Education, First Thursday event. Our three panelists have been spectacular. Um, Vanessa Skipper, Vice President, Brevard Federation of Teachers. Adam Tritt, author, educator, activist, founder of Foundation 451, which sounds an awful lot like a book, hmm, doesn't it? Uh, Fahrenheit 451, for those of you that haven't read it. Anyway, uh, Dr. Uh, J. Michael Butler, he's an author, a distinguished professor of history at Flagler College. Fantastic speakers all. And again, we would be in a room full of people on their feet, clapping, giving you the most wonderful round of applause, uh, all of you. But now it's time for us to turn to our audience and to give them the opportunity to ask questions. Um, I ask, please, let's, we have limited time tonight, so I ask that you please limit your questions to a minute. Uh, I encourage our panelists to be able to cross talk, to ask each other questions, add your, add your own thoughts. Um, but I see that, uh, George, you had your hand up earlier, and, and sir, uh, thank you for your patience. I'm going to uh, say, George, you've got a minute. Ask, go ahead and ask your question. But I recommend that you uh, ask your question to uh, if you want to identify one speaker or all three. Uh, and there you go. George, you have the floor. Actually, um, I work with Adam um, at uh, Bayside High School. And um, I just wanted to, to support what he's saying by, by bringing you up to, so the audience can hear this. Um, this is my 30th year in teaching, and this is the first year that all six periods of my classes, and I teach regular English 2, English 2 Honors, AP English Lit and Comp, and AP U.S. History. All the students came in this year, and the first question they had was, what books are we reading this year? Not, not what, what stories, what books? And, and I... I really think that uh, to, to get everybody a little more motivated, you need to understand that kids are paying attention. Kids, kids are not being uh, swept under the rug on this, okay? But they're paying attention, and they, they are getting involved in, in whatever ways they can. Uh, with, with that being said, uh, we really need to be careful because the opposition is, is really good at projection. And, and we, gotta, we have to be careful uh, because they want to catch us in circular arguments. Um, so when you're, when you're looking about accepting debate or you're invited to go talk uh, on media as a panelist with some of these other people, uh, standing opposed to you, just remember, they're going to try to project onto you what it is they themselves are doing. And, and you can't take the bait. And George, I know um, you have a question. Uh, do you have a question for our, our uh, panelists? Yeah, I, I, I got a question for our historian. Historically speaking, where do we go from here? Because I do not see enough support 
for mass protest like we had in the 60s. I mean, it, there are people who are upset, but I don't see the motivation for it. I'm going to mute and let him respond. Thank you, um, George. Great question. I, you know, I wish that with my doctorate, I got a crystal ball. I, they don't give those out. I have to do something else to earn one of those, right? But what I will say, George, is that I do see, look, look at 2020. Look at the summer of 2020. There was mass mobilization against a man who narrated his own death for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And that can help explain why we are here, because that scared the hell out of people who are, as you put them, the opposition. I think the fact that America is changing, that our kids are comfortable in their own skins and interacting with people who aren't like them, I think that scares the hell out of others. I'm worried about the future of this republic, though. And the reason that I am is because the last time in American history that we have demonized, vilified, and told others that they were less American or even anti-American, un-American, because they disagreed with their political philosophies was in the 1860s. We are at a point now where, and it's tempting for me to do it as well, to say that someone who is an American citizen is somehow less American because they don't see the world the same way I do makes them disposable, un-American. And that's exactly what you said, the circular logic. That's what they accuse us of doing. We can't do that to them. But we are at a point where we can't have disagreements based on facts. We can't even agree what the facts are. So that's the, the downside. Um, the, the positive is what you said about the kids. The fact that they are comfortable being different in their own skin and associating with others who aren't like them or not like their parents is precisely why there's a movement to try to control what it is they're taught. And uh, if I might throw that same question to Vanessa and Adam, do you want to uh, throw in a projection or a, a prediction of where this is going? All I can say, if, if we continue on the, this path, and I think I said it, um, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And I can't imagine um, what it's going to do to our populations of students who come to school for the enrichment of literature and books and learning because they may not have access to it at home. Um, for those students who seek safe spaces in our classrooms um, to be regularly denied those safe spaces because teachers are afraid of getting sued or losing their job or going to jail um, for teaching something that they aren't sure if they're teaching or not because like Mike said, the law is so vague that it leads interpretation, leaves so much room up for interpretation. Um, we, we must, we must go to the polls, we must educate people and we must change the people who are making decisions in our state. Otherwise, we're going to go down the very same dark paths um, that we've already been down in history. Indeed, all politics is local and getting involved and supporting a candidate, getting involved, contacting the school board, going to a school board meeting, contacting your representatives. It's so important. Adam, do you have anything you'd like to predict? Well, let's go right back to literature for the answer. Let's quote, let's quote Thoreau. Gamble, uh, voting at best is a type of wager that has a certain moral tinge to it. Vote not with just a slip of paper, but with your whole being. So going out to vote is good. Do it. I do it. I would. I can't, could live with myself if I didn't. But you also have to go out and do something. If you can't knock doors, drive someone. If you can't drive someone, fill out um, um, postcards. If you can't do that, walk over to your neighbor. Get them to vote at least. Or do something crazy like give books away 
or march. You've got to do something besides just go and vote. And by the way, uh, since you're mentioning that, uh, I have, have been advised that I should remind everybody to keep, um, uh, I think it's Saturday, it's September 30th anyway, keep September 30th open on your calendar or we're watching um, a, uh, a potential rally coming together, uh, 6 to 7, 30 p.m. Uh, down in Melbourne. Uh, but anyway, September 30th, just make a note on your calendar. We'll see if we'll be able to fill in that block. Um, I see that uh, DP has had his hand up. DP, would you like to ask a question of our uh, our panel? I've just got a bit of commentary. Mike, that story was amazing and so well-spoken. And uh, the, the bit about the record store, that's known as the Streisand effect. I'll let you guys Google that one on your own time. Mm -hmm. I do have a couple of questions from Facebook, though. Give me a moment to scroll back. Um, one... Uh, one from Mary Votel. What are the house bill numbers of what you listed above in the intro? I don't know who she's referring to, but I have another question here from her as well. And the chat just seems to keep scrolling. Um, stand by. Um, she said she came to this call to find out where she can find a list of books that can't be used in public schools. I guess that one be, would, would be uh, directed to the founder of uh, Foundation 451. Yes, and it's something that I can't answer because there is no master list. Every school district creates its own list. Now, our governor has managed to create um, enough confusion with Stop Woke, where there's a whole bunch of books that we feel we cannot use, but they are not, they are, while they're not legally banned, they are de facto banned. If that made any sense. You can't, it's just like Slaughterhouse Five was on the challenge list, but because we were told rip it off the shelves, it, the challenge actually acted as a ban. Uh, but every school board has its list. So there is no simple list that we can give anybody that says this is banned and this is not. I did post in our uh, chat here um, the 41 books that Moms for Liberty wants to have removed. So I can speak for Brevard. But since then, it has gotten more confused. And now, if it's not a fall, we can't use it. So Moms for Liberty has not only gotten their way, they've been way more than what they wanted. One of the most insidious forms of censorship is self-censorship. When you intimidate people, threaten them enough with a general picture, you don't necessarily need to even write it down on a piece of paper. It's like a particular uh, former president who acts more like a mafia leader, and that is the, the subtle intimidation uh, witness tampering, that sort of thing, where you're not necessarily saying the words out loud, but uh, everybody reads between the lines and goes, I better not do that. Better. By the way, I saw that on our chat section, we've got um, House Bill 7 is called Stop Woke. So that's something that the answer to that question of what are the actual numbers? House Bill 7, so this is Florida House Bill 7, Stop Woke. Uh, Florida House Bill 1557 is the Don't Say Gay. Uh, the House Bill 1467 is the instructional materials law. Um, so thanks to Mike and Vanessa for uh, posting those in our chat. If you um, haven't been looking in the chat, if you're on the Zoom, please take a look at that. You can find a lot more information than we can cover live here in our event. Um, and uh, DP, do you have anything more for us coming in from Facebook Live? No, that's it. Just a bunch of commentary. If anybody asks any more questions, I'll raise my hand and pass them along. Thank you very much, DP. DP Villeman is uh, our technical uh, advisor extraordinaire. Uh, thank you very much for helping us. And I see Bonnie has her hand raised. Bonnie, you have the floor. I'm mute. Okay. Um, I am lost. I was a teacher. I can't even begin to imagine teaching in this climate. But I'm wondering, what is the right of the governor to make these laws? Uh, what, does the union 
have anything to say about it? Does the ACLU, I mean, can you actually dictate what students are allowed to think? Anybody? Vanessa, why don't we start with you? Yeah, since you Vanessa's role. With the union. Okay, so, you know, uh, we've had these conversations um, at, uh, over and over and over again, and we've spent a lot of time trying to put together materials um, well, at a state level, uh, Florida Education Association and our two nationals, the National Education Association, the American Federation of Teachers, um, to try to help uh, members understand the laws and navigate and let them know what their federal protections are, are as well. And um, unfortunately, in Florida, uh, what we've seen happen in, in education is in 2011, uh, Rick Scott signed Senate Bill 736 into law, which essentially removed the ability of teachers in the public uh, education realm to earn a professional services contract. Now, we don't have tenure. Um, we're a right to work state. We do have the right to collectively bargain, but we did have the ability to earn a professional services contract, which meant if you had three years of effective and highly effective evaluation, your principal could recommend you for this contract, you would get the contract and you had innocent job security. Um, not job security, you could still, you, there's still a path to termination if you are not an effective teacher, but basically what that bill did, and it was the same bill that Charlie Crist vetoed. Charlie Crist vetoed Senate Bill 6. Um, that was one of the last things he did as, as governor. And then in comes Rick Scott. First thing he saw signed into law 80 days after taking office was Senate Bill 736. In a sense, a teacher becomes an annual contract teacher. And so they are a teacher for one year. And at the end of the year, and we have negotiated some protections into our contract for annual contract teachers, but in a sense, the district could decide that they have violated this law or the DOE could say, hey, they taught something they shouldn't have, write them a letter of reprimand and they're gone. Um, and, or they could just terminate their contract without saying anything. You've spent the year teaching here, we're not gonna invite you back and they don't have to give them an excuse in some cases. And so the limitations for, for protections for teachers, it's very small. Um, teachers have always had uh, limited first amendment rights when it came to what th they can say or do in the classroom. And this is gonna limit them further. Um, as far as students, this does not limit students. And honestly, um, this is why we're going to need parents and, and students to speak up and speak out. And they're going to have to be the voices that, that push back on this. Um, we've seen uh, the Supreme Court, uh, well, don't know if I want to go there, but over the decades, um, support student voice in, in First Amendment cases on a regular basis. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's going to get interesting. I see many challenges in the future to this. Uh, and so it's going to become a, a war of, I think the federal government versus the state government, which I think is exactly what DeSantis wants to propel him further. Uh, and so that's, that's how I would answer that one. And uh, uh, Dr. Butler, I know you had something to say. Yeah, uh, to, to add on to that, Bonnie, I would say that the legality of it is at the point. This is a manufactured culture war mm -hmm. that DeSantis is using as red meat for his political base. Yeah. He's not stupid. He went to Harvard and Yale. He knows that what he's doing is unconstitutional. As a matter of fact, last week, a federal judge in Tallahassee said, stop woke is unconstitutional. The fact that it's going to be overturned is neither here nor there for him. That's not the big picture. The big picture is the soundbite. I call it the 2024 on the libs platform that he's trying to build. Yeah. Right. So the legality of it, what it does to communities, what it does to people is not his concern. He knows that this is not going to hold up in a court of law. I've had the ACLU contact me about a case that they're filing against the governor. He doesn't care. The point is the soundbite. The point is to stand up and say, 
we don't allow this in the state of Florida. I'm stopping it. That's the point. So when he does that, the cat's kind of already out of the bag. The legality of it's an afterthought. And then when it's overturned, he can just say activist federal Obama appointed judges are stopping the will of the people of Florida. It's all a manufactured culture war to label those that don't agree with his policies as something other than equal Americans. And, and back to my point again uh, about definitional theft, stop woke is a great example of that. Woke was used by our students to say I'm now awake. Now woke is used as a pejorative by dumb people to shame the compassionate. So yes, the end game is not whether or not it's legal or it will be overturned. It probably will be overturned. It'll be stopped. The purpose is to make people angry and to make people afraid so that they put him in the positions of political power that he's seeking. That's just my opinion. Well, and I think it's uh, a good one. Uh, the, the truth is, this is propaganda for political purposes. Uh, it generates votes, it generates volunteers, and it generates dollars. Uh, the bringing, bringing money into the process to, to uh, promote whatever uh, concepts you have. It, it, anyway, uh, I see Larry, you have your hands up. Uh, you have a question, Larry. And by the way, Larry, thank you again for organizing this event tonight. You are our hero tonight. Thank you very much, sir. Again, round of applause for Larry Abdullah for making this event possible tonight. Larry, your question. Uh, well, first, uh, I want to say I'm awed by the speakers today. I'm just in awe. And uh, a quick comment on, on tyranny, 20 lessons for the 20th century. Really quick, but this is what we're facing. One Number Wait, one. Just, don't... Larry, Larry, you got to burn that book. Uh, you shouldn't wave it around too much. you got to burn that right now. What's the matter with you? <laughs> One is do not obey in advance. Otherwise, don't obey the vague logs, you know, but they're vague enough. The, the other is, you know, support your institutions. And we have seen so many institutions under threat. Now, education, not even the FBI, libraries. I mean, uh, and, the, and the, a, th a third is believe in truth. As we face tyranny, th those are three. Uh, and then having said that, I, I just want to ask uh, Dr. Butler, and then maybe a similar for high schools, if I have a chance, uh, wh what have you seen happen to professors so far? I heard you at Pinita saying that you were seeing it coming. Everyone was seeing it coming. Another professor told me that. What have you seen actually happen to professors? And what is the U United Faculty of Florida saying about this? Well, unfortunately, the United Fa Faculty of Florida uh, is in a similar situation that Vanessa described for our teachers unions, you know, it being a right to work state, which again, what an oxymoron that is. Um, yeah, they have basically gutted the unions for crises like this. Flagler is private, which is a benefit. Some people have asked if I have more academic freedom than in some other places. And not really. We are just as conservative or as progressive as our board of trustees wants us to be, number one. Number two, in the public arena at the University of Florida's, your Central Florida's, your South Florida's, DeSantis is going after tenure to make the positions of the college professor even more tenuous. The other thing that's happened, and we they did it this spring at Florida, to ensure philosophical balance. Students are being quizzed, surveyed on the political views of their professors. Now, what's happening with that information? Nobody knows. But it's another scare tactic to say, we're watching you. The other thing that's happening, and that's, you know, first, the union is weak, tenure is being attacked. Two, students are being weaponized against their own professors. Three, classical institutes are being placed in colleges to ensure, again, intellectual balance. You know, um, it's the, the fears and the realities and the issues that are facing Adam, facing Vanessa, and are facing all of our teachers 
are coming to higher ed. I think I'm really worried about higher ed because sometimes college professors get stuck in their ivory towers talking to each other without realizing the flames that are kind of building around them. So Larry, that it really does make me nervous. And there have already been attempts to limit the academic freedom that university professors have. Adam, would you like to talk about um, at uh, high school level? Um, looking for where I am so I can, there we go. <laughs> I thought I was muted. What is it like at the high school level? It's, uh, the teachers don't generally make enough where they can afford to lose their job. So it's, it's nice to say, don't obey a law before it's enforced. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what Larry said, of course. Um, but that's exactly what we're doing because we cannot afford to lose our jobs. Um, just, just yesterday, a teacher in Oklahoma um, lost her job because she dared to tell students they could get books other places than the school and gave them a QR where they could access the library. This was followed by a letter from the uh, Secretary of Education or whatever the position is for the state of Oklahoma asking for her teaching certificate to be revoked. So she not only loses her job, she loses her livelihood. She can't even get another job in Oklahoma. This is where I see us headed here. Terrifying. Um, Vanessa, would you like to uh, throw in your two cents worth on this one? Um, I uh, totally agree with Adam. Uh, looking at uh, the ability of a uh, administrator to give a directive to a teacher and if a teacher refuses to follow that directive, it, it is in subordination. And, you know, obviously I said it before, Florida is a right to work state, but we've seen this happen nationwide. And there's decades of Supreme Court precedent of it um, where, you know, teachers have a very, again, limited uh, First Amendment right when it comes to what they can and can say or do in the classroom. And it, it you know, matters not um, about, you know, whether you're in Florida or New York or California, um, Supreme Court rarely sides on the side of a teacher um, when it comes to things like this. Uh, so we obviously are cautioning our teachers to listen to the, to the directives. Um, but you can also see like the different intonations in the different schools and the different ways administrators are approaching it. Some administrators are saying to teachers, use your professional judgment. And some administrators are like, I better not see your classroom library out unless you've checked this list. And there's no clear directive coming down from the district, even though they said there was. Um, they're basically uh, kind of allowing all these interpretations to exist out there. And, you know, I think this whole thing is going to be very, very subjective um, for, for a long time. And it, it leads it up to interpretation. And unfortunately, the wrong people are interpreting it. And, well, maybe the right ones, according to the, the governor. Um, and so, no, I would agree with exactly what Adam says. Uh, there isn't an ability for teachers to um, not obey this. Uh, and that is why we need the community. We need parents. We need students. We, uh, as educators, need people to stand up for us. Um, I'm reminded of the, of the poem, you know, who's going to be left to speak out? If you don't speak out, who's going to be left? You know, first they came for, for the communists or first they came for um, whoever it is. First they came for the teachers. First they came for the, the students. Who's, who's going to be left at the end? Um, and so educators right now, we, we have spent a lot of time being the voice for our students in our classroom, uh, being activists, uh, act you know, actively asking for what our students need. And when the students don't get it, getting 
those needs for our students, but now we need the public to do it for us. We need parents and students. We need the community. We need those voices um, and those activists to, to join us and to stand for us. Um, that's, that is what public educators need in Florida. And I saw that uh, Mike posted in the chat, this is modern day McCarthyism, another, mm -hmm. a, a very good way to describe this. Um, and again, that, that begs the question of, do most people know what McCarthyism actually means? And, and those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it, aren't they? Anyway, back to DP, I see DP, you've got a question. I've got one more on Facebook um, from Marcus Hockman. I hope I'm pronouncing that name right. If I'm not, I apologize. He wants to know uh, if any of you have sat down and tried to have conversations with the M4L leadership, either on a local or a national level. A great question. Who would like to take that? I can share one example that I've had. I, I, I do try to at least ask questions. I don't, it's hard to reason with the unreasonable, right? <laughs> and if people are interested in having a conversation, I'll have a conversation. If they're interested in accusing me of doing things or not knowing my history, which I get all the time, do you teach history the right way is what I'm often asked, then there's really nothing to talk about. Um, however, when I came, the last time I was actually in Titusville, Vanessa, it, the Harry T. Moore Center had invited me to discuss at a public forum, CRT, what it is and what it isn't. And when I went to the, the venue, it, there were a lot of people there. And the person who organized it kind of caught me coming in and she just said, I want you to know that we've invited all of the candidates for school board positions to attend this, this session. And we saved three seats up front for the Moms for Liberty candidates. And we have plain closed officers in the crowd to make sure that they don't try to intentionally disrupt the event. They didn't show up. So my, for DP's questioner, my point is for, they don't want to have a conversation. They wanna create a scene. They want to grandstand. They don't want to have a debate with someone who is willing to call them out and can recognize their tactics for what they are. We never know what lands with people. So I would never say don't engage with them. But that's why the asking the questions is so important, right? Have them, put them on the defensive, make them answer their own questions. Uh, but I, I don't think that most of the people that we see as the loudest community activists really want to have an honest conversation because they're not acting in good faith. I had a yeah. conversation with Ms. Beaver of the Moms for Liberty uh, regarding her vehemence, uh, her hatred over the book Forever by Judy Bloom. Uh, this is after I sent her the song by Amanda Palmer, Judy Bloom. <laughs> which, which they got us off on the right foot. Um, and she said that the book, the theme of the book is that you should have sex as early as possible. And that this book, I can see some of you have read the book. I can see from your faces, you're like, no, that's not it. Uh, and that this book ruined her as a child and she is still suffering from it today. And with every bit of compassion I can muster, which sometimes is, is more than others, I said to her, this is not the theme of the book. The theme of the book is first love may not last, and that's okay. You shouldn't expect it to. And that if she believes that this one book damaged her so deeply, she desperately needed to seek care. That was the last thing I got to say to her before she'd walked away. It's an honest assessment. I thought so. <laughs> Vanessa, do you have anything that you'd like to uh, throw in there? 
Um, I definitely have talked to leadership at um, obviously the local level for sure um, on these issues. And um, we have uh, people obviously that lobby on the, the uh, state level as well. Um, I went up during the legislative session and um, went to several debates um, and discussions in the Senate and House on both the don't say gay bills and also on the instructional materials legislation and did speak um, a couple occasions. The thing about it is, is when it comes to CRT, um, as Mike mentioned, those candidates didn't show up. And I have specifically spoken to, to one of those candidates. I'm not going to, to mention that person, um, but I asked her if she would consider removing CRT from her website, from her campaign website, because it was clear to me after the question I asked her that she didn't understand what CRT was. Mm. And she said she'd have to think about it. She didn't remove it. And honestly, we know why. That is a vote getter. It just is. And so um, I will spend you know, as much time as I can trying to advocate for um, teachers and for students and for people to honestly understand what CRT is and what CRT isn't. And if that means talking to, to people that um, are willing or unwilling to have that conversation, I'll do it. Incidentally, I would like to once again uh, encourage those of us that are on Zoom to take a quick peek at the chat. Uh, because both um, uh, Vanessa and Adam uh, uh, have summarized uh, Pastor Martin Niemöller's uh, wonderful poem that talks about first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. It goes on from there. The, the lesson, of course, from the Holocaust of at some point or another, uh, you have to speak. You have to fight for, for your friends and relatives and fellow citizens, even if it even if their issues are not necessarily uh, obvious that they're yours, but we as a society must speak out and fight for our teachers. We must fight for our school system. We must fight for public education um, because it benefits all of us. You know, it may be 50 years since you were in school and maybe you never sent your kids through the public school system, but every child that is educated and becomes an educated adult benefits our society as a whole and it benefits all of us. So we must speak up in whatever way that we can and act in whatever way that we can to support our teachers, to support our school systems, to support public education before they take it away because that may actually happen. Our next question from Jan. Jan, you have the floor. Hi there. Um, I'm trying to think of how to formulate my question, but evidently books influence the public. They influence children, they influence adults, but there are other forms of communication that also impact people, such as movies, even TV commercials. It's amazing to me, being a child of the 60s myself, you know, when I know that in the 60s, when there were demonstrations and things going on, that there were a lot of movies that came out that addressed some of these concepts and became, you know, infamously famous for what they were doing. But even today, when I look at commercials on TV and I see mixed marriages and, and you know, different genders of people, and it's amazing how much this stuff has come across on a national, international level as far as impacting people and impacting young minds, talking about kids that are comfortable with things today that their parents are not. And one of the reasons I think they are is because they're exposed to these other things and other for media and other forms of media. Is this whole resistance to what is happening in books, is that reeking into uh, that as well? I mean, what do you guys see as far as that? I, I don't know if that's a good question or not, but. That's fine. It's it's a great question, and and who would like to uh, to, to uh, tackle that? Uh, Mike, you're nodding your head. Uh oh, but I think you might still be muted. I, I was muted. I was muted. I just need the cup that says you're on mute, so y'all could hold it up, right? <laughs> uh, no, it was a good question, and I think that is exactly what scares some people so much is that they see on TV people being allowed to exist as human beings 
and if they don't agree with it, they're afraid that their kids are going to come home acting like that. So yeah, I think the fact that society's changing, I think the fact, I mean, another thing that's kind of understated is that whites are becoming a minority. And that's when you hear some of the white supremacist rhetoric, it's closely associated with some of these movements that we've talked about. We hear a lot about the great replacement theory, right? This fear that whites will be replaced by a minority population is something that really, really scares them. Um, and you do see it with same-sex couples. You do see it with LGBTQ rights. You do see it with social movements. And that's some, that you see it manifests itself in stuff like Stop Woke and the um, former president's administration, right? They hate the same people. They fear the same people. And those fears are being reinforced in popular society. And they think that it's, well, I, I'll kind of go off on a tangent there. I'll let Vanessa and Adam chime in. But yeah, they see a changing world and they don't like it. Controlling the education is one way to try to control their worldviews, preserve their worldviews. Adam, Vanessa? I agree completely. I couldn't have said that better myself. Adam? Um, um, yeah, I have my own theory on this. Literature by black folk is fine if they're black folk or realize they'd be better off as white folk and are aspiring to be white folk. And literature by uh, gay folk is fine as long as they realize that they'd be better off being straight folk and they aspire to be straight folk. And uh, I mean, I could go down the list, uh, which is why we have uh, literature that's largely um, um, man by the by these groups that is uh, very conciliatory. Um, we, we don't have anything that's angry, really. We don't have anything that's uh, confrontational. So as long as they realize they'd be better off being like, you know, like like Trump, I, I, the literature is, is okay. I mean, this is an incredibly important, you know, philosophical um, overview of, of what's happening. And perhaps why it's happening. And, and it's important, I think, at the end of our discussion today to boil it back down to what can people do? What can the average person, the person that's watching this, the person, and remember uh, that um, folks that are watching this aren't necessarily watching it live. Uh, our Facebook live uh, feed will, will be uh, viewed many times by people uh, over, over uh, the coming weeks. What can we ask and what kind of action items would you like to leave with our, uh, with our viewers, with our guests, with our, the folks that have been asking questions, with our members? Um, I know that, um, that uh, Dr. Butler has given us uh, an action items, voting, um, be honest with yourself and be honest with other people about the things that they say, um, educate yourself. Uh, learn what the issues are um, and follow the legislature, follow the legislation. Uh, somebody had asked, you know, how to look up what the actual house bill numbers were so that they could um, become uh, uh, more literate on the specific house bills themselves or house and Senate bills that are, they've gone through our legislature. Excellent, excellent action items uh, from the doctor, Adam, Vanessa, what kind of action items do you have? Um, on a local level, I would ask people to pay very close attention to the school board meetings, um, to attend the school board meetings, to consider signing up for public comment. And if you go on to brevardschools.org ahead of time, you'll be able to view the agenda and you'll be able to see what they're discussing at the school board because they've changed the policy and who can speak when. Um, and so you speak during the first general public comment session, you get three minutes to speak on agenda items that they're taking action on. Um, and then they have another public comment section at the end of the board meeting, usually it's between one and two minutes, depending on how many people sign up to speak. But um, the Moms for Liberty are always there. 
and they're always speaking and they ramble on and on and on. And while their numbers have dwindled, uh, I have a feeling that they will start to pick back up. Um, and so it's important that there are um, just as many counter voices in the room and that um, the school board sees that it's not just that small group of people um, speaking for the entire county. So I think that that would be action step number one. Action step number two is you have a great power of influence around um, the people that you uh, are with every day, whether that's coworkers, whether that's your neighbors, your friends, your family. And I would ask for you to um, share the stories that you heard tonight with them um, and, and do your part in raising awareness of this issue and also raising activists to this issue. And finally is the voting piece. And uh, I can't remember who said it, but they're absolutely right. We have to do more than just vote. We have to get out the vote and get out the vote however makes you feel more comfortable, whether that's phone baking for a candidate, door knocking for a candidate, um, volunteering to stand at a poll, um, volunteering to be a poll worker, uh, whatever it is that gets you out um, and, and influencing uh, not only knowledge, but um, getting people to get to the polls to vote for change. Magnificent. And Adam? Uh, you need to go to the school board meetings if you can. Don't let them outnumber the people who have sense, logic, facts on their side. The other thing that you could do, should do, is if you have a child in school and you're happy with, with the teacher, don't let the negative ones be the only people who contact principals and school board members. If you like your child's teacher, contact, email, because emails are, or emails belong to the public, phone calls disappear. Email the principal. Tell them the teacher's great. Tell them you are so glad that child is in that class. Email the school board members. Tell them how happy you are that teacher is employed in our schools. Let them know. Don't let the angry minority, the senseless minority, be the only ones who get a voice. And uh, if I might uh, uh, toot your own horn, I would actually encourage people to go online to www.foundation451.org. Take a look around. Uh, and and the foundation451.betterworld.org. Um, uh, these are posted in our chat section. If you haven't um, already clicked on those, after our event is done here in the Zoom, you can uh, go up there and, and uh, click on them. If, if you're not quick enough to do that, grab your phone, take a quick picture of what's on the chat, and that way you'll have a quick uh, permanent record of, of that. Uh, this is a trick that young people have taught me, and that is when things are happening fast, take pictures and that way you've got it uh, recorded. Um, this has been a wonderful night. Um, I, we, we actually have a, a, just a couple of quick minutes and I would ask uh, each of our panelists if they would like to close with uh, a minute, just a, a thought uh, before, we, before we end this event and before I have a few more close, uh, uh, words to close with, uh, just quickly go, go through the list. Vanessa, would you have something, a closing thought, closing comment? I just want to reiterate uh, what Adam just said. There are great things happening in our classrooms and our schools around the district. Um, there have been so many attempts uh, throughout the decades to dismantle public education. And the fact of the matter is, is the majority of students are educated in our public schools, over 90%. And, you know, students who choose or parents who choose to take their students out of public school and go to charter or private are turn around and are back into our schools within two years. Um, and so the idea that um, 
lawmakers want to dismantle the very cornerstone of our democracy, our public schools um, should be frightening to, to everybody. And I really hope that um, this this panel and this this opportunity tonight spurs people to action. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to be a part of it. You're one, you're very welcome. And it's been wonderful having you. Adam, uh, would you like to throw in your two cents with here? Um, yes. Don't stop fighting. Don't give them any room to breathe. Keep hitting, keep hitting them. Get out there and keep working. As far as what we're doing, we, uh, we've, we have barely begun. We have other projects coming up. We are putting out multiple little free band book libraries. We're working on a web app where we can send books to people because we understand having transportation is often a privilege for people. And certainly purchasing books is a privilege for many people. So we're going to be sending books out and we are working, though it will take us a while, on our band wagon as well. It will be a mobile library for banned books. Oh, that's beautiful. So if you the, feel like making that happen wagon. and you got an extra 20K, <laughs> I know how to use that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Adam. And, and uh, Dr. Butler? Yeah, I wish I had something as profound as, as that. But what I will say is that in studying totalitarianism, um, one of the ways to justify totalitarian regimes and everything they do is to rewrite the past. This censorship of history should bother us all because that's straight from the fascist handbook. You rewrite the past to justify the present. Don't ask, because in all totalitarian regimes, I see this, it's victims inevitably ask, how much worse can it get? Mm. Don't ask, how much worse can it get? Or maybe that it can't happen here because it has happened there. We are the only republic in existence to, it not, to have not at one point in our history lost it. Just because we haven't lost it doesn't mean it can't be lost. Defend our teachers. Defend decency. Don't let people shame you for caring about others and being a compassionate, empathetic person, because that's really what binds us together, doesn't it? So I, I really appreciated the night and I appreciated the opportunity to speak. Uh, it was a great panel and some great questions. So uh, thank you, Larry, for inviting me. Thank you, Phil, for moderating. And thank you to Adam and Vanessa for sharing the panel with me. And thank you, Dr. Butler, for some wonderful, wonderful uh, insights and, and uh, action items for us tonight. I would like to remind everybody that the program must not end here. If you, if you leave this event and just keep it to yourself, uh, we have failed. So we ask you, please do something. Take those action items to heart. Make a note for yourself. Do something uh, that we've said here uh, and, and change the world. Uh, it's your actions that really count. Um, I would like to remind everybody that our next event will be Thursday, October 6th, and it will be focusing on electronic voting. Voting is so important, and people are talking about voting in elections and that sort of thing. The idea, the concept of electronic voting is, has been around for quite a while. We're going to go in-depth in that uh, October 6th. That's our first Thursday in October. Uh, we hope to see all of you then. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone who has joined us, both on Zoom on Facebook Live. Uh, keep the conversation alive. We look forward to seeing you next month. Um, and those that are actually are on the uh, Action Projects Committee, I ask you to stay on stay on the, the, the Zoom so that we can have our chat. And if there's a way that we can take everybody off of mute so we can give our, uh, give our um, speakers a round of applause, can we do that? Can we bring everybody off mute? Not sure if we can do that. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to our speakers. We thank, thank you, you guys. so much for being here tonight. We, we really appreciate it. What a wonderful night. Thank and, you. And thank you, everybody. Good night.